It was a great first, uh, first uh, half of the afternoon there uh, with the cases. Now we're going to get on to a couple of short talks and then we'll get to the Schwartz lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the latter part of the afternoon is my partner, Tony Botigi. Tony was uh, born, I think he grew up in Lexington. His father's a local pediatrician. Spent a fair bit of time North, there. But, yeah. Went to undergraduate at SUNY in Binghamton and went to medical school at uh, SUNY in Buffalo. Came here to do his general surgical residency. He was my intern when I was a third year resident at the VA. And that turned out okay. Um, he uh, stayed here to do surgical critical care fellowship and then went into private practice in Louisville and also did <clears throat> EICU, virtual ICU, in Louisville for a time before coming back here, joining the trauma faculty, and having a part-time appointment at the VA. Tony's risen through the academic ranks, is now associate professor of surgery, is medical director of the surgical ICU at the VA, is heavily involved in surgical quality at the VA. His big interest is in uh, EMS. He's an EMS medical director and has developed a keen interest in tactical EMS. He's been nominated to the Kentucky Board of EMS. So Tony's going to talk to us today about tactical emergency medical support. Tony? Right, thanks. Is this on? All right. I just want to say a couple words. This is the uh, Schwartz Lecture. A few current residents, uh, unfortunately, did not have the privilege of uh, working with Dr. Schwartz. I was present here from 2000, 2005 and a fellow. I got to know Dr. Schwartz pretty well. He was a good mentor. And uh, he and Dr. Sloan were instrumental in me coming back. I already knew you know, the blue guys when that job opened, but you know, I, I got honest answers straight up about what's going on at the VA. And he's always been a good go-to person, no BS, straight to the point. And I've always admired him for that. And the other thing that uh, made uh, Richard and Janet very special to the residents is every year after the ab site, they would invite us over to their home just to have a you know, decompress, have a good time. And you know, Janet, that's something we, we still cherish and remember and, and appreciate that as well. So it's, it's my honor and uh, privilege to be up here to uh, talk about something probably of you, most of you don't know anything about. It's going to be a little long. I'm going to try to speed through it. Uh, I'll try to keep it a little interactive and entertaining here. But uh, uh, talk about tactical emergency medical support. You know, I tell people all the time, uh, you know, I'm on SRT, you know, special response team. People are like, well, what is that? Well, there's multiple names for it. Uh, SORTS, special operations response team. Rapid response team, RRT, fast action support team, uh, Fast Action Response Team, FAR, well, that mnemonic doesn't work very well. Uh, but most people know, most people recognize Special Weapons and Tactics, or SWAT. So that's essentially, SRT is SWAT, and it does its job of toning it down. So when I say SRT, people are like, what? Versus, hey, I got you know, SWAT training today. So uh, as Andrew said, you know, Woodford County EMS you know, Medical Director, raise point, uh, they were needing somebody. And long story short, you know, I, I, I knew the assistant director, you know, getting into the Thames uh, field, so he got me on that. And then part of the duties of that is being the medical director for the special response team. And after being on the, on the team for a couple of years, they, they swore me in. So yes, this is not cosplay. This gun's real. This badge is real. But just so you know, I checked uh, Dr. Sloan, Dr. Bernard, UK police and legal saying, hey, I'm showing up like this. And the reason why I'm like this today so it happens to coincide with my training day. I'm leaving here straight to training. So it just happened to line up this way. So, all right. So what are my other qualifications and how did I get into this? Uh, I met Bill Schmock at the Trauma Symposium several years ago. He's on the Louisville SWAT team out there. One of the ER docs talked to him. Julia Martin was there. She forwarded me something about a training program back in you know, 2015. I, so I took, I took combat casualty care as part of a TEMS course. It was a good 40 hours is an entire week uh, course where it was you know, lectures, you know, tactics, and then TCCC, and then hands-on in the field care. So by definition, what, it, what is TEMS? It's hard to read here, but the National Tactical Officers Association, this is their, their definition. It's the mission pre-planning, preventive care, and medical treatment rendered during mission-driven, high-risk, large-scale, and extended law enforcement operations. Time scope of practice includes medical interventions that further the health and safety of all law enforcement personnel and is intended to reduce the incidence of injury, illness, disability, and death associated with police operations. Thames adapts and incorporates sound medical practices with police tactics, 
for use in operations characterized by competing mission objectives, diagnostic uncertainty, limited resources, and performance uh, decrement under stress to permit the delivery of effective medical care and unfolding law enforcement mission. So essentially, on the medical support for the SWAT team. The goals of tactical emergency medical care, you know, enhance mission accomplishment. Well, everybody has that role. Prepare medical threat assessment. I'll go over that later in the talk. Monitor uh, the medical effects of environmental conditions. You know, today, not a big deal, but last month, it was 90 degrees. You know, looking for effects of dehydration, et cetera. You know, if it's cold and wet, watch out for hypothermia. Tell the tactical commander what's going on. That may change the timeline on a call out where you're going to sit and wait or you're going to go ahead and you know, take care of business. Uh, this is the part I hope I never have to do is try to reduce death and injury and illness related effects among team members, innocence of perpetrators, but I'm there for the officers in the event of the uh, unfortunate. And you're all familiar with, um, I'm sure, with uh, Scott County 217, who was recently admitted. Uh, so hopefully I don't have to do that for Woodford. And uh, re reduce lost work time if I keep somebody from getting injured or, or going too far and hurting themselves, to, not on workers' comp. This is probably the main thing I do is maintain good team morale. They think by having me around, it gives them just that little bit extra edge. You know, in reality, am I going to make that big a difference in the field? Probably not. But if I can give them that five extra percent chance of getting home to their kids, they really appreciate that. Um, you know, maintain health and preventive medicine. You know, uh, not tweaking their blood pressure meds and stuff like that, but just you know, washing out for things that can get them acutely ill. Coordinate with surrounding agencies and hospitals. Well, here I am with UK and the trauma center, decreased liability, you know, uh, for both the law enforcement and you know, citizens, and uh, possess basic forensic knowledge and crime scene preservation. Essentially, don't touch it, don't do anything. So, why do we need towns? Why should we care? I mean, unless you live in a cave, you kind of watch the news, you know, lately. But I just want to you know, let you know that this isn't something that's suddenly brand new out of nowhere. Now, how safe is your school? I Googled this, found it on the internet. And they say also school shootings are becoming more common. Myth, I'm not going to get into that, but let's just say the perception is becoming more common. Uh, you should never expect it to happen at your own school. Threats have happened at Shenandoah, but thankfully it's never more than just a threat. A lot of students don't know, however, back in 1990, a discontent student named Greg Oswit entered high school east wielding a shotgun. Well, Columbine is 420, 1999, so that's already nine years before Columbine. Everybody knows Columbine, right? So this is not something new, but some of the, some of the themes are the same. And one of the monitors remembers it. The shooter came into the front door, walked right through the halls and the courtyard. Uh, it's where the principal was able to convince him to drop the shotgun. I think there's more to the story than that. Uh, he was not happy with certain students. He was looking to kill certain friends, quote unquote friends. So that theme uh, continues today. Specific targets in mind. He was con convinced to turn himself in, et cetera. Nobody got shot, nobody got killed. They didn't hit all the media and all the mass hysteria we have. But that's nine years before Columbine. Obviously, I'm not going to go over Columbine. This is a picture of, of Mr. Oswit here getting taken off. And people say, all right, let's, let's just ban guns. That takes care of the problems. Well, in China, just recently, you know, this spring, nine kids dead, 10 injured uh, with stabbing. So, you know, banning knives is an idea that doesn't seem to work. This is not a, a, a fake, you know, article here or, or some type of a parody account. Um, other reasons why we should care, you know, if, if you've watched the news lately, there were these people out in New Mexico that were planning a terrorist attack. They found out it's actually going to be a hospital. It's actually going to be Grady, not even in their state. So they're targeting trauma centers. So if you're thinking about where to cause mass chaos and you know, disrupt a trauma system, we'll go after the center. Well, has there ever been anybody here in Kentucky that might cause some disruptions? You know, these guys, Bowling Green, uh, they were actually you know, helping Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But now that they've seen these ideas, you know, monkey see, monkey do, you know, we could be potentially at risk for you know, an attack here uh, at UK. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, just a matter of time, there was a shooting in Marshall. This was in the spring. Uh, this was a disgruntled student thinking about sh going up and shooting up Dunbar. So it, it, this is real. It's getting close to home. There's no way to legislate evil away. It's, you know, a lot of you are too young to remember, but uh, prior to 9-11, the biggest you know, mass killing and terrorism in the United States was done with a 
white van and fertilizer. It actually killed more people than the uh, Las Vegas uh, you know, shooting. So you don't need a gun to take out a lot of people. Why do I care so much about this? I wasn't at Columbine. I wasn't at Virginia Tech. I wasn't at Parkland. But I am class of Shenandoah in 1992. I was a sophomore the day that this guy came in. So that left a little impression on me. So uh, this is kind of you know, my passion, my interest is you know, preventing these things and realize you know, it happened to me, it can happen to you, it can happen again. So moving on from that, what is the basis of care for tactical EMS? Well, a lot of the things in trauma we get out of the military, tactical, tactical combat casualty care, uh, the civilian is tactical emergency casualty care. Like I said, I took that course at the beginning. I'm gonna talk, I can't cover TCCC, I'm just gonna give you a quick you know, rundown on this and then integrate that into how we, 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 we merge you know, the tactics of medicine and police work. So in terms of zones, the cold zone, safe environment, no threat to safety outside the perimeter. The shooter cannot get a bullet you know, on a straight line to you. Regular EMS principles apply. The warm zone, the threat's not considered imminent, but still exists. You know, somebody could pop, pop out of somewhere and you know, ambush you. The hot zone, the, the potential is real, the shooter's active or is barricaded in, in a certain area. And the Hartford Consensus, which I hope you all are aware of, you know, it's put out by the American College of Surgeons, uh, breaks down the zones as well to the hot, you know, red, yellow, green. And what they say is, so if you can kind of compress those zones down and get some overlap, uh, you can save lives and get earlier hemorrhage control. Um, you know, the three phases of T triple C, uh, first one's care under fire. This was where airway, C-spine precautions, CPR, they're deferred. I mean, rounds are coming at you, they're, they're getting close, you're just get, trying to get the cover. Extremity hemorrhage is a priority, that's the number one cause of preventable death uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and you know, theoretically in the community for mass shootings. Tourniquets are key, and you try to encourage self-aid if possible uh, to try to you know, free up your hands, et cetera. Mitigate the threat, suppressive fire, um, and place patient in a rescue position if you can't you know, get them out of the way, which is on their side. And evacuate the patient to a safer location as soon as possible. And then that takes you to the second aspect, which is tactical field care. This is medical treatment occurs in the warm zone. It can be just a matter of dragging somebody around the corner in an area of cover. And cover is not the Hollywood cardboard box that magically stops bullets. You know, it's around a hard concrete wall. Um, Airways addressed here, you know, it's 1.8 cause of death. All those patients had penetrating injury to the face. And if you can't get the airway, it's, you, know, you don't muck you around with you know, intubation straight to crike. Breathing, a pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, three to 4%, all potentially preventable battlefield deaths, sucking chest wounds. So why would we care about something that's so low percentage? Well, it happened. A KSP detective was shot in a, in a pot field out in the holler somewhere. It took several hours to get help to him. Other officers were there. He felt helpless. They couldn't do anything. Coroner's cause of death was tension pneumothorax. And this was a 100% preventable cause of death. So very unfortunate, although 1981 EMS is a little rudimentary, but you know, our, our goal is to you know, get rid of all of these. Tactical field care. Once you're in cover, you reassess the bleeding. Do I need to adjust the tourniquet or reapply one? Do they really need the tourniquet? Uh, hemostatic agents, this is your quick clot, you know, the stop the bleed stuff. IV fluids only if they're in hemorrhagic shock, you know, permissive hypotension, which I hope you guys are all familiar with. Hypothermia prevention, you know, we carry it on the big mylar space blankets and stuff to start covering them up. Analgesia is important because they found that uh, the more pain they have up front, the higher the rates of PTSD, and particularly ketamine can decrease that rate in the field. So TCCC endorses ketamine, the right way to use the word endorse. Um, uh, <laughs> prophylactic antibiotics, that applies more to the, uh, the military, uh, you know, with long transport times, but potentially could be applicable in Eastern <laughs> Kentucky. You know, some of those far out fields, now, even in Woodford County, there's some remote areas that are, you know, difficult roads, uh, et cetera, that you could be 45 plus minutes away and they don't have good landing zones for helicopters. 
appropriate cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, often futile in the field, but I read that it's very important to the team that if an officer goes down, you do CPR no matter what. They want to see you doing everything you can as the patient leaves, leaves the scene. So, and if, they, if you don't, they have a lot of you know, psychological issues, et cetera. So the, the, that, the caveat that that is is don't put people in harm's way unnecessarily. If somebody takes a round to the head out in the open, is laying there obviously dead or high probability of being dead, you're not going to send four more guys out there to get shot up either. That's a call I hope I never have to make, but it's one of the responsibilities that I may have to do. Uh, so combat casualty evacuation care is the cold zone and the safe area, traditional civilian field care takes over. ALS en route to the receiving facility, TXA, as we're seeing now, it's, you know, do we give it empirically, wait on the, the tag? If it's a long transport, yeah, I might, I might say, you know, give it. Blood, you know, some services, you know, the, you know, some of the flight crews have blood in the field. That's uh, something I potentially could coordinate uh, with, with the bluegrass, you know, have some blood available. For, it's a really, really high risk situation. Um, tactical evacuation care, that's a little bit more focused on the military, but there are situations where we may have to have our armored car ready to go in and scoop somebody up and go. So there's another acronym called the MARCH protocol. Uh, you know, it's not ABC anymore. It's Massive hemorrhage control, tourniquets, airway management, uh, you know, usually very basic unless somebody needs a crike, which should be rare. Respiratory management, needle decompression, uh, finger thoracostomy is, has been mentioned. Although that's a little bit, you know, that's not your basic paramedic skill. Circulation, bleeding control, the fluids, hypothermia is often overlooked. We do it routinely here, but you got to think about it in the field. Head, eye, and then everything else. Um, just a quick word on tourniquets. Uh, I, I gave a talk a few years ago on that. Uh, but you know, say somebody's shot up on one of the floors for bed. We don't have tourniquets up there. And how long do you think it'll take to get one from the ER? So you may be called upon to improvise a tourniquet. And this has happened at hospitals. Somebody got shot. There are no tourniquets to be found. So improvise versus commercial. Obviously, if a cat, use that. But it should be wide enough to compress the vasculature without causing uh, excessive pressure, so don't use a piece of paracord. Uh, you know, use some curlex or something. Should have a mechanical advantage, such as a windlass. Avoid a venous tourniquet. You know, crank the sucker down tight. Uh, you know, can be as effective, although in reality most of them failed. The Boston bombing is that famous picture of the guy with the cowboy hat and the belt. Every improvised tourniquet in Boston failed. None of the police had commercial tourniquets, and none of the EMS did either. Guess what? They do now. So. Uh, it's not the way you want to find out you need them. Uh, you know, they can't cause more pain, but you know, who cares? Uh, but here's how you put one on. So you have to use one, use a wide bandage, wrap it down, tie your windlass in there, which would be a rigid you know, stick or pen, crank the sucker down, and then secure it. You know, the old belt, uh, it's, it's going to be worthless. So there's my two cents. Hopefully you never have to use that. So what's the... Uh, Let's see, hold on. All right. So what's the appropriate response to, to mass shootings? Well, there's something called Rescue Task Force and something called Tactical Emergency Medical Support. Obviously, this is my talk, but this is closely integrated. They're, they're similar, but a little bit different. And why, and why is this so important? Uh, you think we'd learn from lessons past. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't. You all remember the Pulse nightclub shooting. Uh, I remember it. I was at Disney with my family last week. That was the initial target. But due to security, the guy went to a softer target and shot up this nightclub instead. So a lot to read here. So uh, a lot of criticism. Unable to implement active shooter policy and supplies firefighters and paramedics with ballistic vests. Hey, we should get these things. That's a great idea. Didn't get it. Needed it. Uh, reporting this delay help to the, this reporting says this delayed help to the wounded claim Orlando's leaders continue to dispute. Of course, the politicians are not going to take the blame. 49 died, 53 injured in the attack. A study uh, this year said uh, as many as 16 could have been saved if they received basic care within just 10 minutes and to the hospital within an hour. So we're talking a very fine window to get to these people. Uh, so any bureaucratic delay or we're not familiar with this, it, it's just not going to work. And you know, their answer was, we're not prepared to go in the hot zone. That's just not what we do as a fire department. It was active shooting. Um, 
uh, not everybody you know, felt that way. Um, you know, they said they did drills, it wasn't enough. They said they didn't have formalized training. Well, you know, shame on you, you should have. We didn't have a policy, we didn't have a procedure. We had the equipment, uh, but it was locked up in ES EMS in a storage closet. And unfortunately, we were you know, a day and a dollar late. You know, it's like the Titanic. They had enough lifeboats, they decided not to put them on the Titanic. So let's not keep the ballistic vests where they're actually accessible. So the timeline was at 202, they started shooting. Um, police officers come out of the woodwork. Um, officers went inside you know, to, to go after the shooter. Almost 20 minutes later, uh, they tried to come up with a way, how are we going to get people in there? They couldn't figure it out. A few minutes later, they're asking for fire department to come in. Uh, and the Justice Department said that's the time they could have gone in, yet the fire department was not allowed to enter. Like I said, there were, what, 50-something deaths, you know, from that event. 250, the shooter threatened to blow things up. And remember, the shooting started at 202. It's 250, they're still not in the building. Um, people show up, they actually finally brought the ballistic vest to the site. In a pure bureaucratic, you know, answer, uh, they were not allowed in because the paramedics hadn't been trained on how to use the vest. That would be the same equivalent as saying you're in a sinking boat, You've not been trained to put on your life vest. We're not going to let you wear it. You put the damn vest on. There's no magic to it. Um, deja vu. Um, well, sorry, a similar uh, story. Uh, they're frustrated. Sorry, no. On the Parkland. So this is just you know, within a year or so. Same state. You think they would have come up with some protocols. Uh, a rescue task force presented at the commanding officer of Broward County Sheriff Office. Request denied, the type of response was not appropriate at that time, since the location of the shooter was not known. They said RTF can be employed only when law enforcement can clear an area for EMS. I call absolute total BS on that, and I'm going to go over what you're supposed to do here in a minute. Uh, and they said medical teams are willing uh, to risk their lives going in the scene. The commander said, you know, pretty much no. Uh, and once again, people are willing to say, you know, we're willing to go in there, risk our lives. And they're told, no, don't go. Paramedics asked six times to enter Parkland before they, you know, they were told no every time. Uh, Coos is finally caught around 340. He'd actually left the building at 221. So that's an hour and 20 minutes later, and they still would not let the, uh, the fire department in. Their response was, oh, SWAT medics went in instead, although nobody knows how many or what. They said it wouldn't have changed anything. Now, the paramedics are saying, they're not saying RTF would have made a difference, but you never let us in. We will never know. But going back to the Pulse nightclub shooting, you know, just 10 minutes is what they said would have you know, possibly saved some lives. So I'm going to start going over what the appropriate response is supposed to be in these situations. So rescue task force, initially EMS personnel show up and rapidly deploy in the area. They're not tactical medics, they're the first arriving fire department. Security is provided by law enforcement teams that show up. If there's a shooting, you're going to have 100 plus officers. You know, if, if something happens here, there'll be 100 police here in five minutes. Uh, so you're going to have people you know, ready to, to you know, get these guys in. EMS is going to be out here quickly. SWAT team will be 30 minutes to 60 minutes before they gather and show up. Um, so after review of shooting data, you know, obviously the sooner you can get in there and stop the bleeding, the more the survival. The immediate threat is rapidly mitigated in almost all uh, incidents well prior to fire and EMS even responds. Well, not in Pulse, not at uh, Parkland. Uh, risk factor active shooter incidents very low in areas that are cleared but not secure. I'll go over that here in a second. Care is not initiated by the law enforcement teams. They can be trained but may create role confusion. Their job is to go after that shooter. If their fellow officer gets hit and falls down, they'll just step over them and you know, keep going. The reason why they do that is they know, theoretically, we're coming up behind them to try, try to take care of them. You know, and part of that's because it takes equipment and training skill set, and they have other responsibilities that they have to do. Uh, they need to be doing the tactical police work, uh, so it's poor use of serve, uh, um, resources, having them you know, carry patients, et cetera. Uh, 
You need personnel to secure key real estate, hallways, stairwells, large open areas, perimeter control. You have lots of officers everywhere. They're trained to move to the shooter, not initiate medical care. Tactical medics are not always readily available. A few teams are full-time in this state. I think maybe Louisville and then uh, KSP are the only full-time uh, teams. Um, they have a different dedicated job to do. Sorry, I'm kind of moving quickly here. Um, how many medics on the team? Uh, on my team is myself and then two uh, paramedics, which is probably the most in eastern Kentucky. Uh, there's some teams in you know Louisville area, but I'm the only one. I think I'm the only physician in eastern Kentucky. There's a couple in, in western Kentucky. Uh, so, we're, so we're you know right here. You know we're the highest trained you know Thames unit in, in you know at least several counties around us. So initial law enforcement response. Uh, you know they enter the building, move to engage the shooter. They hear gunfire. They have intel to, to drive to that location. If there's nothing, they do a hasty clear and keep moving forward. Contact teams are clearing as they move down to the sound of the shooting, and this is where Rescue Task Force comes in. They start to come in behind into the warm zone. You know, as this team's going down, they're identifying threats. They radio you know, patient down here. They don't stop to start treating them. They'll notify there's somebody down here that needs help. They're going after that shooter. They're not opening locked doors unless they think there's a shooter in there, but they'll do a, a hasty clear of an open room. Hence the warm zone. Somebody could pop out of that, that locked door. Um, clear versus secure. This is where a lot of the confusion comes in with the police. Secure is secondary search. That's after you blitz through, you're going back, opening every cabinet, you know, looking under everything, etc. Clear is just a quick, no immediate threat. Police training emphasizes the site must be secured. This is where the conflict comes in and why they won't let people in. It's not clear. It's not safe. Um, so by the time you secure an entire you know, large building like a school, uh, it's too late. You know, the, the quick clear at Marshall was several minutes after the shooting in Kentucky. The KSP guy told me it was 10 hours before they finally cleared it. They were x-raying every suspicious book bag, et cetera. So RTF works when resources enter quickly. This is not the you know, kind of, you know, it's one of those stage and go type things. But if the police aren't familiar with it, they're not going to deploy it in a timely fashion. So they obviously weren't at Pulse. They obviously weren't at Parkland. Uh, so the initial response, I'm running out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to fly ahead here. But this is the initial you know, response, is law enforcement stages you know, front and rear security. The firefighters with their ballistic vests or EMS are in the middle. They're getting escorted in. The, those first teams are charging down through. They're coming up behind. So if there is somebody still lurking in the warm zone, it's these guys' job to, to take it out. And this is actually Las Vegas, the rescue task force formation. You can see the officers here and the fire medics, you know, they're, they're stationing up there. Communications, it's usually police to commander, commander to EMS, back to EMS. It's kind of a triangle. Uh, PPEs, ballistic, hearing, eye, and then uh, body solution, you know, gloves, etc. Hearing is important. Uh, you know, the decibels on those rifles the police are using are 160 decibels plus. That's outdoors. If you were to fire that off in here, you, you would definitely have some hearing damage. Knee pads, you know, you're going to be down on your knees taking care of people. You don't want broken glass, etc. The equipment's different than regular EMS. It's just pure, you know, rapid bleeding tourniquets. Airways, uh, basic King Airways, splints, et cetera, versus, you know, you're not bringing in oxygen. I'm not carrying a big explosive thing on me. Uh, no monitors, you know, just very basic equipment. Get in, get out. Um, stabilize as many people as you can. Get as deep as, as safely into the building. Grab, uh, remove, move on. Uh, get out to the casualty collection point. And for the sake of time, I'm going to just kind of speed up here. So here's kind of the Diagram of it, like I said, the initial threat. Law enforcement's coming in. They're going after that shooter. It sounds a like gunfire. They see him. They're going after him. They're stepping over wounded as they go. They let the rescue task force know. They're coming up in the rear, and they're going to start to assess uh, you know, the damage to treat and extract those patients in real time, not wait for everything to be cleared. This is the cold zone where the incident command is. And they can leapfrog ahead. Let's say it's a big building, it's a lot of time getting people out, it's not completely cleared, you get a casualty collection point. Uh, we ran this drill at Woodford School. It, you know, the initial, the, the police setup was not a good one. We tried to explain you want 
a smaller room with preferably one door to have to guard, uh, ground floor window accessible so the firefighters can come in and rip those, those windows out and you can start extracting people. So here's kind of the timeline here, how theoretically it's supposed to go. Uh, and you kind of compare what it's supposed to go to what they did in Pulse and Parkland. The initial response, you're going to start getting you know, uh, police showing up in about four minutes. That's going to be a long ass four minutes if you're in that building, but that's the time it takes. Hopefully it's quicker, hopefully it's not longer. People are going to be running out of the building, your arterial bleeders are going to start taking effect. Uh, you're going to start getting some, uh, your, your, your bad arterial injuries are dead, three minutes, three to five minutes. You cannot save those individuals. Uh, law enforcement is starting to speed ahead clearing. EMS is forming up, hopefully around four, five to six minutes. And we have you know, people stationed all throughout Lexington, so that's theoretically possible, as long as they're allowed to gear up and start getting in. Uh, law enforcement continues to charge ahead, clearing. Uh, Rescue Task Force starts entering. You start going back to that march, massive bleeding, airway respirations, and then uh, uh, head injuries it's, uh, and hypothermia, et cetera. So you get away the, the risk benefit um, of you know the rescuers versus the civilians, and I can tell you everybody that's a rescuer says you know we're going in, we'll we will take that risk. So that's rescue task force. Thames is more uh, medical conscience of the team commander. We're there for the tactical unit. You know we're there for the police. We're giving them that extra medical support. So when they go into harm's way, they know there's somebody right behind them that's going to take care of them. So it, it takes a uh, you know, a certain amount of courage to barge into a room where somebody could be you know, staring you down with a <clears throat> shotgun or charging up uh, some stairs. We don't know if somebody's there ready to take you out. And uh, at KTOA, you know, they had the CERT team uh, come in. Uh, the, the hit rate on somebody against a police officer is 66%. So if somebody decides to shoot at a police officer two out of three times, they are going to hit them. So knowing that, you know, my hat's off to those guys that are the door kickers. Um, medical threat assessments. Uh, I don't know if I have time to get to that. I'd like to, but remote assessment methodology, medicine across the barricade. So this is when TEMS would come into not just RTF, high risk warrant. Possibly the, the number one reason why we would get called out. High risk. The guy's known, you know, felon and wanted for murder, etc. Close target reconnaissance, high risk investigative support. Go back to the you know, the pot field at the beginning of my talk. High risk large search area. So there was a shooting. This guy ran into this neighborhood. We have no idea where he is. They closed down a perimeter. Then it's a slow, methodical search going in there. Obviously, barricade, hostage, you know, incidents. Uh, high risk prisoner transport. Where you think somebody's going to try to spring this guy? Um, high risk short term protection detail. We've had uh, Pence and Trump here. You know, lately, thankfully, I did not have to get involved in any of that rigmarole. Uh, terrorist incidents, uh, other situations requiring uh, TAMS requested by law enforcement. Uh, so three, echo, enter, evaluate, evacuate. Um, and then hybrid TAMS and RTF, you know, you know taking the charge. Uh, I'm just going to skip ahead here. So this is kind of what... Whoops, kind of what the hybrid's supposed to look like. Hot zone getting charged in by the law enforcement officers, followed by the tactical emergency medical support, followed by rescue task force one, two, three, you know, returning into the triage area. So like we said, in the Hartford consensus, you are compressing those zones, hot, warm, cold, to try to you know, minimize the time and the delays. And I can tell you that's theoretically how it goes. When we ran the drill in Woodford, uh, it was during the summer, school was closed, the entire police force was there, the entire fire department was there. We ran through it the first time. It was 15 minutes before they started letting the firefighters come in because the police, certain ones were still locked into that. We got a secure everything mindset. And they had one of the guys from my team, you know, being the bad guy with sim guns, and it was as close to reality as it can get. So they had to take him out before they would let anybody in. They said, no, no, that's not the way it goes. Ran it again a little bit better, and then ran it a third time. So by the third time, things were starting to get closer to the way it was supposed to go. So the bottom line is you can tabletop this all you want. you got to actually get out there and do it. 
I put this up just to see who's, who's still paying attention here. That's John Wick, for those of you that live in a cave. Um, so, medical threat assessment here. I think I'm getting ready to run out of time, but essentially additional jobs I have are to look for any medical threats, such as environmental, biological, chemical. You know, we read a lot of meth houses, carfentanyls out there, and a popular thing is for the drug dealers to throw a big cloud of of drugs into the officer's face as they enter in the room. So they're not shooting them, but the officer's going down in about 30 seconds to a minute, et cetera. Watch out for that. Some people may have exotic pets. You know, Somebody may have a pet cobra or some crap like that, and you may want to order up some special antivenom. Actually, when I, my class, somebody, the instructor said they raided somebody's house that had some special vipers. And when they entered the house, the guy was charging down the hall at him with two snakes in his hand. <laughs> So just you know, be aware, be aware of that. There's, uh, think of the crap we see in the ER, the stuff they see out in the streets. Is you can't make this stuff up. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit. Sorry, I had, had a long talk. And but you know, part of my responsibilities include you know, coordinating with the helicopter, trying to pre-plan a landing zone should we need it, et cetera. Having the equipment to, to designate the zone. Um, try to come up with a pre-plan. Yeah, like I said, I could talk on this for a long time. I'm running behind on time. So my main goal is to be the commander's conscience. One of my main jobs is to kind of give him my, my opinion. He may say, no, you have to come up with workarounds, but I am not the end-all, be-all. This is not the cockpit analogy where anybody can call stop. I do not have that authority. It's his final decision. All I can say is, here's my recommendation against this. He can take it or leave it. The one time he kind of asked us our opinion, me and the medics on something, and the team in general, but he was kind of looking at our opinion is you know, not to get too much into tactics, but you know, there's the stack up with the guns down. Now the new thing is stack up with the guns up so you can get your sights on faster. Well, if you practice that every day, that's one thing, but what's the main risk between down versus up? If you discharge down, you shoot somebody in the ass of the leg. I said, you know, we can fix that, but if it goes off like this to the back of the head, organ donors, you know, the best, best case scenario. So, we all decided that unless you're doing this every day, it's not worth a discharge into the back of somebody's head. Because one of the riskiest things we do, even though at Woodford we don't get a lot of call outs, is our live fire range. You know, that's, you know, we have 14 guys lined up, turning, moving, and shooting. There's a lot of potential for an accidental discharge with lots of equipment. Safeties get clicked off. It can easily hit, you know, snag something and cause it to fire. Um, thankfully, we've not had one of those. It won't take once to shut us down. But that is definitely a, a, a known risk. So, so I'm going to wrap up here in a second. Uh, just to, sorry, another thing is medicine across the barricade. Somebody's hostage. You know, Cletus is angry, shoots his wife. She's on the ground bleeding. He doesn't know anything about medical care. It's kind of our thing to talk them through what's going on. Here's what you can do to try to help your wife. We're not the hostage negotiator, but we're trying to, you know, get things going. Um, so this is kind of something that, you know, that we kind of practiced in my class, as well as like assessing in the dark, extricating, et cetera. Education's another thing uh, that we do. Uh, you know, we've put the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm part of Kentucky Tactical EMS. It's a brand new Nonprofit organization in the state, our goal is to train and educate things such as Rescue Task Force and Thames to surrounding counties to try to cut down the incidence of, uh, of, of death and mortality and morbidity if in the event of a school shooting, et cetera. Like I said, it's just a matter of time. Uh, but if we can do anything to cut that down, we're going to do it. Um, and I'm you know, the medical director for this. Uh, we currently have 52 requests for training, 10 of which are TEM, so that's 42 rescue task force, 51 instructors, goal of 160. You know, one of our instructors is Les Fryman. I think some of you may know him here. He's one of the Kentucky Fire. Um, you know, it's one of, one of the big things we do. You know, me and the other medics, we put all the Versailles Police Department through Stop the Bleed. We're going to do the Woodford County you know, Sheriff's Office. Uh, next, there's been other requests from Anderson County, Scott County, et cetera. So teaching's a big thing. We just don't have the time and resources to do it. Um, it says Kevin Combs. He's the instructor. Very engaging guy. Um, 
He's the one that you know really developed my enthusiasm for this. This is one of our rescue task force. It's full moulage, as realistic as we can get it. Um, you can see, you know, there's there's your security in the back there and there, and he's making sure that's not a bad guy. And there they are going out, and I'm hoping somebody's going to tell this guy, "Hey, you're about to back into a pallet." Um, so, any, any questions? Not as many that should. It's mostly emergency physicians. But as you know, Dr. Eastman uh, uh, in uh, Dallas, you know, he's a, actually a reserve police officer. He's on the SWAT team. Uh, you know, actually, one of the fathers of TAMS is Dr. Richard Carmona, former Surgeon General. I met him at the Kentucky Tactical Officers Association several years ago. So as a surgeon, we should be involved. We should be part of it. You know, tactical combat casualty care is a subset of American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma right along there with ATLS. So, yes, it is something we should be take the lead in, and you know, it makes sense. You know, we're, we know the trauma center. We know the resources. And the main thing I, I tell the team is, you know, I'm not going to be able to do anything out there in the field, but how many times have we had that patient come in and code in the ER or two minutes out from the ER or as soon as we hit the OR table, if I can do anything to cut that time down, you know, EMS calls on all the time, oh, you're gonna to need to go to the OR. How many times do we actively, actually activate the OR? Where if I call the OR, or I call the ER and say, we're coming in with a red, Greek them, get a medical record up, up there now, and I call the OR and say, we're coming in with a red straight up. I've already done a fast. Yes, we do have an ultrasound machine. Get x-ray up there in case we need it. We're coming straight up. That may cut down some of that time. That may give them just that little extra edge uh, and just them knowing that is is their morale boost. So, and well, thank you for your yeah. service. Be careful out there. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Our next speaker before Dr. Edwards is Dr. Tiffany Wright. Dr. Uh, Wright is a native Kentuckian, grew up what? in Webster County, went to Murray. We were lucky to have her come here for medical school. She was one of those medical students who was always around. And then she became one of our residents, and she was always around. And I think she thought she was going to go back to Webster County and do private practice. Or maybe I was going to get her to be a trauma surgeon, but that was slim. And then sometime late, like fourth year, In July, fifth year. she decided to do pediatric surgery. So then she uh, couldn't go straight into pediatric surgery at that point. She went to the University of Michigan and did fetal surgery for a year. Then did pediatric critical care, became boarded in pediatric critical care. And then Louisville was lucky to recruit her there as their fellow. She did two-year pediatric surgery fellowship at the University of Louisville and now has joined the faculty at UofL. So it's great to have her staying here in Kentucky. I really wish she was here, but... Uh, an hour and a half away is uh, almost as good. So Tiffany, thanks for joining us. Tiffany was one of those uh, folks who got to be a medical student, uh, gathered around in a group outside Dr. Schwartz's office waiting for him to come and do the almost daily teaching sessions. So I know she remembers those days very fondly. Thanks for uh, asking me to come. I only got the privilege of having Dr. Schwartz around for my first two years of residency, but um, loved him very much. And I have a feeling that if he was here right now, he would not be super excited about talking about non-operative management of appendicitis. <laughs> so here's my disclaimer. I am not advocating for non-operative management of appendicitis. I think it's stupid, and if I show up with appendicitis, please just take my appendix out. Um, but... It's becoming an increasingly relevant um, topic, and I think it's important for us to talk to patients to know kind of what the data says about it. Um, appendicitis is the most commonly performed emergency general surgery procedure. It's important in my life, in the acute care surgeon's life, um, because it kind of bridges both of those age groups. Um, about 30% is perforated at presentation, and that's not what we're talking about here today. Um, and it's typically more severe at the extremes of age, probably because it's delay in diagnosis. So 
for all of my medical training, management of uncomplicated appendicitis was not controversial. You take the patient to the operating room and take out their appendix. The same is not true of complicated appendicitis. There's always kind of, should you operate? Should you drain it? Should you treat it with antibiotics? Whatever. Um, but this non, non-complicated appendicitis controversy is somewhat new. Um, it's now all over the news. I was on vacation at the beginning of my fellowship and was watching the Today Show right around the time that one of these studies we'll talk about came out. And it, I mean, they were talking about it on the Today Show. Hey, now you have appendicitis, you don't have to have surgery. So I think it's important for us to know about. So um, there's been some people looking at non-operative management of appendicitis since like the 50s, but the real studies, the big studies started coming out in like the mid 2000s um, and mostly in Europe. So this first one, um, they wouldn't allow them to randomize to put women in the study, so it was just men. Um, and they randomized them to appendectomy versus non-operative management. Um, and basically found a 14% recurrence rate at one year with no significant difference between hospital length of stay and time off of work. These were all, for the most part, open appendectomies. Eight of those 124 patients had laparoscopic surgery. The second big study a couple years later, again, found that about 22% of patients had recurrence at a year. Um, the complication rate in this study, also in Sweden, was much higher than, one, than I would expect. Um, they had 10% major complications. Now, these were, again, almost all open appies. Um, but they had nine post-operative abscesses, four bowel obstructions, five re-operations, including two hemicolectomies from malignancies in the specimen, which they count as a complication. But it almost seems like a win for the surgical arm, right? I mean, if you had cancer in your specimen and you treated it non-operatively, that would be a problem. Um, they had a really high rate of um, perforated appendicitis in this study. They didn't talk about how they made the diagnosis, whether it was just clinical diagnoses or whatever. Um, but I think there were a lot of perforateds that made it into the study. So the real big study, um, in adults anyway, um, was the APPAC trial that came out in 2015 in JAMA. Um, they enrolled 530 adult patients um, and randomized them to either three days of IV ertapenem, so three days in the hospital on IV antibiotics, followed by seven days of outpatient antibiotics, versus, again, mostly open appendectomies. Um, they found that they, they set a pre-specified non-inferiority margin of 24%. So if there was a less than 24% one-year appendectomy rate in the non-operative group, they would have called that a success, and they did not meet that. Um, but what they found was that basically a 20% overall complication rate. Now 24 of those patients, 23 of those 24 surgical site infections were superficial, just superficial wound infections. Um, and then these 23 patients with chronic abdominal pain never had any proof that they had any sort of a real problem. They just had chronic abdominal pain that they were attributing to maybe adhesive disease. Um, but in the non-op group, 23%, 27.3% ultimately had their appendix taken out. Um, so just a couple of months, last month maybe, um, the APPAC trial published their five-year data in JAMA, um, looking at the five-year follow-up rates of these non-operatively managed patients. And you can see that it goes up a little bit every year um, and is up to, at five years, 40% almost of patients. And their conclusion says, this long-term follow-up supports the feasibility of antibiotic treatment alone as an alternative to surgery for uncomplicated acute appendicitis, which I think is fascinating. We don't accept a 40% failure rate anywhere else in medicine. Um, but I guess it's just your perspective. I mean, I guess if you really want to avoid surgery and you're comfortable with that. So, all of those studies were done in Europe, and I don't think there's a whole lot of interest in non-operative management of appendicitis in adults in America, but the pediatric surgeons love it. One of my partners says that pediatric surgeons are constantly trying to non-op ourselves out of a job, but it's hard to get um, prospective randomized trials done in kids. So this um, is a meta-analysis that was published in JAMA Pediatrics in 2017 that looked at five studies that were all prospective but only one of them was randomized, and it was very small. So it's mostly just post, 
prospective case controls, where they had 404 patients total, um, and at one month, 90% of the antibiotic treated patients were better. But again, their failure rate um, at a year was about 27%. Of note, the subset with an appendicolif was significantly higher. There was um, the one study that was included in this that had an appendicolif they actually stopped enrolling early um, because the failure rate was so high. Um, the cost was less in the non-operative management arm. Um, the stay was shorter in the surgical group. Now, these patients were all laparoscopic appendectomies as opposed to the older adult studies. Um, and their mean time of disability was shorter in the antibiotics group. Um, so one of the things that I think we all worry about is well, what happens when they recur? Are they sicker when they recur? And all of those previous adult RCTs would say no, that the complication rate when they recur is no higher than um, if they had had it the first time. But this is a meta-analysis that was done of those studies um, with larger patient numbers, and they found that um, the rate of complicated appendicitis with perforation at the time of surgery was significantly higher in the antibiotic group. So 19.9% of the patients presented with complicated appendicitis compared to only 8.5% of the people that were um, initially treated with surgery. And there was no difference in this study of the, the huge meta-analysis of the post-intervention complications, length of stay, period of sick leave in the surgical versus non-surgical group. So one of the other arguments that people often use for treatment of appendicitis um, with antibiotics alone is cost. So this was a retrospective review published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 2017, looking at the cost of non-operative management to the cost of lap -appy. Um the, the initial length of stay between the two groups was um, similar, and the cost, the initial cost of the two was significantly higher with appendectomy, but the recurrence rate was 35%. So when you include their subsequent care related to their recurrences, um, the total hospital cost was the same between the two groups. And the link, total length of stay was actually higher in the antibiotic patients. So everybody's always talking about, you know, patient and family-centered medicine, letting them sort of help make the decision. So what do the patients want? Um, Pete Minichi at Columbus is really into all of this uh, patient choice stuff. Um, so he did a <laughs> prospective patient choice cohort study um, and enrolled 105 patients and let the, basically the kid and the parents choose whether they wanted surgery or antibiotics. I don't know. <laughs> Did he go to? Oh, right. Yeah, correct. So um, non-operative management was initially successful, again, in about 90% of them. And again, at about one year, 25% of them had failed. Um, the non-operative management group had a slightly longer length of stay. Whether or not that difference is clinically relevant, you could argue. Um, this study quoted a post-op complication rate that was lower than those adult previous studies at 7.7% at one year, but most of those complications were really minor. The only two that they considered major complications was one readmission and one patient that got a reoperation, but it didn't say what for. Um, the health-related quality of life scores that they asked the patients and the parents to fill out at one year were similar between the two groups. We're currently participating in the follow-up study to this, so it's a multi-center um, Again, patient choice study. So we've been enrolling patients for, I don't know, I did it in Michigan and have been doing it all the time I've been at Louisville. Um, and most patients do not choose uh, antibiotics. Our, we've actually had to increase our um, enrollment targets to get to the threshold of enrolled antibiotics um, patients. I think it's probably like somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of patients actually choose antibiotics. This was a web survey published in JAMA just not long ago where they asked 1,700 people. They gave them some information, some scenarios on laparoscopic appendectomy, open appendectomy, and antibiotic treatment alone. And they asked what they might choose if they or their child had appendicitis. Most of the respondents were female, and most of them were sort of 30 to 60 years of age. Um, most of them chose lap for themselves. 
um, and a small number chose antibiotics alone. Interestingly for their child, more of them chose antibiotics alone and not surgery. Um, I thought it was interesting how many people chose open epi. They were more likely to choose antibiotic alone if they had postgraduate education, which is, I think, also interesting, or if they knew no one who had previously had appendicitis. 100% of this, 11.9% of the people in this survey were surgeons, and 100% of them chose surgery. But like 10% of them chose open epi, which, again, I think is fascinating. <laughs> I would not choose an open epi. So... <laughs> What are the hesitations to widespread adoption of this? Um, so, I mean, personally, concerns about progression to complicated appendicitis. My first month as an attending, I did two laparotomies for bad ruptured appendicitis, and it was maybe the two most miserable cases of my life. Um, the burden of worrying about recurrence. So every time they have belly pain for the rest of their life, are they going to think that it's appendicitis? Are they going to come in and get another CT scan? Um, you know, all of these previous studies have someone who had a tumor in their specimen, so there's that. 50% of carcinoid tumors of the appendix, I think, present as acute appendicitis, and it may be hard to delineate that on your preoperative imaging. One of my biggest concerns is that all of this now is becoming really widespread in the pediatric literature. It's in, like, JAMA Pediatrics. So similar to what has happened in a lot of places with small bowel obstructions, when we decided to stop surgically managing, you know, to non-operatively manage bowel obstructions, they started getting admitted to medicine doctors in a lot of places. Um, so I worry a lot that, you know, pediatricians and general internists are going to start treating patients with antibiotics for appendicitis without getting us involved. And still the overwhelming majority of patients and parents still don't want it. Um, one of the things that's sometimes quoted is that the reason that we're hesitant to adopt this is because we get paid to take out appendixes, but I don't I mean, maybe it's because I'm on salary, but I don't think that this plays any role in most people's decision-making. Finally, I don't know if any of you all are tennis fans. I am not, but I've been told that Rafael Nadal had appendicitis, and it was, like, in the middle of a season, and they treated it non-operatively with antibiotics, and he sucked for, like, months because he <laughs> was, you know, still on all these antibiotics, and then they took out his appendix, and now he's better and back and whatever. So if anybody needs to use that as an example. Dr. Wright, there, there's a lot of really interesting numbers there. The, the, the data is interesting. A couple of interesting things that I saw there was the look at cost. We presented data from here showing we can save about $1,000 on the hospital admission if you just send them home for the PACU. So I think there's a way to drive down the surgical cost. Sure. I'm interested in what you guys do with kids there with regards to going home for the PACU or short stay. My second question is about health literacy. So the, the most educated folks are the ones who were saying, give me antibiotics. And, and that might work for them. But uh, you know, health literacy is poor in, in Kentucky. And sometimes that's a chance to eradicate something that could be very dangerous in a child in a, in a culture where health literacy is not that good. And that, that kid could be at risk going home if we're depending sure. on family members to, to pick up when the kid gets sick. Can you comment on both of those? Yeah, so we typically admit them post, I mean, we typically admit them postoperatively and then tell them if they feel like going home, you know, a few hours postoperatively, they can. I think in general, parents' thresholds for how much suffering they're willing to take a child home with is much less than what we, you know, gallbladders we a lot of times admit because they're not well nauseated and their pain control is not great and the moms invariably would have them back in the ER um, if you tried to send them home like that. But some, occasionally we have some people that go home a few hours post-op, but most of the time they stay till the next day. Um, we, with regards to that big red, big um, prospective study that multi-center that we're participating in. The cities that typically have better educated populations have had much more success um, enrolling patients in the antibiotic arm. And when I go down and talk to somebody, you know, I try to be like as unbiased as possible and it's kind of hard. Um, but they actually have to take a quiz afterwards about whether or not you, like, they felt like you were swaying them one direction or the other. Um, but it also goes along a little bit with the anti-vaccination stuff. So like in Ann Arbor where everybody's really highly educated or whatever, there's 
so many people who don't vaccinate their children, which I think is crazy. But they also don't want I mean, don't want surgery for their appendicitis. Yeah. So the one that we're doing right now, yeah. they have to have Im they have to have imaging that um, says that they have appendicitis. But our actual criteria for enrolling patients is so stringent that I think a lot of them don't actually have appendicitis um, and could still qualify for the study. You know, their white count has to be less than eighteen thousand. They have to have had pain for less than two days. They can't have a fecal lift on their imaging, and their appendix can't be bigger than like a centimeter. Um, so. I see patients all the time that would meet that criteria that when I examine them, I'm not really sure they have appendicitis, I admit them, hydrate them, and the next morning they're better, and we send them home with no antibiotics and no surgery. So many of my partners that refuse to enroll people in this study um, argue that it needs a third arm, one where perhaps you did nothing, because maybe it's just a you know, self-limited viral infection and not truly appendicitis. And clearly, if you treat those people with, with antibiotics, they're going to get better. Hello, sir. Some that you would That I would not immediately operate on? Yeah. <laughs> In uncomplicated appendicitis? If I didn't think they had appendicitis. We're, we're pretty aggressive with operating on complicated appendicitis, honestly. We have a pretty poor... Um, IR availability, and so that's why my two first cases of my first month of attending life, I ended up doing like laparotomies, and one of them I couldn't even find the appendix. It was a mess. I was going to have to give them a colostomy, I'm pretty sure, to like find it, so I just drained some pus and got out, but we're pretty aggressive with operating on even complicated appendicitis um, kind of from the get-go, unless they're well appearing with a really big, well-defined abscess that you could from across the room and they're kids so most of the time they get better <laughs> other questions Dr. Wright. Dr. Wright, thanks very much Thank you. well it's my distinct pleasure at this point to introduce the fifth uh, Schwartz lecturer I could stand here for about 20 minutes and list accolades and tell stories about somebody who means a great deal to me, uh, but I won't take that long. I do want to tell you about uh, Dr. Michael Edwards. Dr. Edwards is a native of Georgia. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and then went to medical school at Emory. He was then trained as a resident surgeon at the University of Louisville under Dr. Hiram C. Polk, one of the uh, preeminent surgical leaders of our time. Upon completing a fellowship in uh, general surgery, uh, Dr. Edwards then went to the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where he pursued a surgical oncology fellowship, followed one year later by a young surgical oncology fellow named David Sloan. After completing his surgical oncology fellowship at uh, the MD Anderson, he returned to the University of Louisville where he took his first faculty position under Dr. Polk and then rose there through the ranks when he was associate professor of surgery at University of Louisville. That is when I met Dr. Edwards. He was at that time conducting breast ultrasound courses throughout the nation. I was in the laboratory at the time and he extended an invitation to me to come over and learn breast ultrasound in one of their courses at the University of Louisville. He rose to the rank of professor of uh, surgery and chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology at Louisville, and then accepted the position of professor and chairman at the University of Arkansas. He served in that position and as chief of staff at the University Hospital there until November 2007 when he moved to the University of Cincinnati to assume uh, the chair role at the University of Cincinnati. He's currently the Christian R. Holmes professor and chair there and serves as Vice President for System Development. He's been responsible, along with the Dean, for coalescing 17 different physician practices into one unified practice plan. 
in a similar model to what we have here at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Edwards is recognized nationally and internationally as a surgeon, surgical specialist in surgical oncology, and as a healthcare leader. He served on numerous committees, executive positions, and as president for national professional societies. He's been funded continuously uh, for almost 20 years through the VA, the NIH. He's been PI or co-PI, responsible for over $15 million in what his CV considers to be major funding, uh, but that's followed by 24 other funded uh, external projects and grants for which he's been PI. He's on the editorial board or is reviewer for almost two dozen prominent surgical journals. He's an inventor, has designed numerous surgical devices and founded a number of development companies. He's published over 250 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 18 book chapters. Uh, he has been guest lecturer or invited uh, uh, speaker over 50 times at major universities. He's also an alpine skier and a climber. Uh, he does that uh, most often from his home uh, that uh, he and his wife Carol own in Jackson, Wyoming, which I've discovered is just a few hours from the Wind River Range, and uh, perhaps I can um, get an opportunity to stay at, uh, at the Edwards home there and take advantage of some of that. To relax, Dr. Edwards uh, races automobiles is the real deal, actually. He owns Edwards Motorsports. He holds a license to race motorsports in the United States and in Europe under the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile. He is, for real, a semi-professional, I would say, race car driver. His son is a, is a ranked uh, race car driver in the United States and in Europe. And maybe he can tell us a little story about that. If, if, if he doesn't get to that in the Schwartz lecture, I encourage you to ask him uh, or Carol about that tonight at the, um, at the reception. Uh, Dr. Edwards is, is foremost just like Richard Swartz. He's a surgeon's surgeon. He is a revered educator, and he's a great friend. And, and it's, it's my honor to introduce him here and welcome him as our Thank Schwartz you. lecture. Mike. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Well, it's a real treat for me to come back to my adopted home state of Kentucky. Um, I got to know Richard Swartz when um, I was an attending here, and um, I didn't know him well. Uh, but I think I know, knew enough about him. Um, he had an infectious smile, uh, a contagious optimism. And we would see him at uh, events like the ultrasound course. We would see him at uh, events like the Kentucky chapter of events. Uh, programs put on between UK and U of L, um, and I really uh, came to really appreciate his optimism and the way that he engaged uh, the work of the day, but also just the way he engaged life through the experiences and especially the relationships that he built over time. You don't just name a lecture for a person who isn't deserving, and I, I can tell you that I knew from the first time I met him he would be deserving. Um, I think if he were here with us today, he would tell you, uh, as surgeons, during the days we live now, we have more power to do good with great medicines, with great imaging, uh, with great tools than we've ever had. And I can tell you today, I know of no prior time uh, to be practicing surgery, the noble calling, uh, than to be a surgeon today who's as I say, earned validated self-respect. And we're going to talk a little bit today about self-respect because at the end of the day, it's, your happiness is going to stem largely from the person that knows you best, and that's you. And so uh, you could go to an M&M &M and you can pay lip service to a complication and hurt a patient and sweep it under the rug, and I guarantee you you will not be nearly as happy or content with yourself or as honest with yourself as you should be. But if you go to an M&M and you confess your sins, absolve yourself of a bad decision, a bad technical move, and then you can put it behind you and you can move on. And then when you lay down at night, you can think about yourself and try to become a better person. 
No, true nobility as a surgeon stems from trying to be a better person tomorrow or today than I was yesterday. And so I want to, in this talk, speak a little bit about the nouns that define us and help us derive um, self-respect, the nouns that define us and help us derive satisfaction in surgery, the, the things that we do as people, uh, as surgeons, to engage our personal and professional lives, and how we can experience the glory, the true glory that, that is surgery. The problem, and I saw that in Richard, he, he lived the glory that was surgery. If you see him lecturing, if you see him teaching, you knew that he, he really enjoyed and had that optimism. But today we're faced with an issue called surgeon burnout, and I think burnout is actually a euphemism for depression and frustration. First frustration and then often depression. And you wonder, how, how can surgeons be burned out? Um, but evidently they are. It's not just a phenomenon we've labeled. I did this uh, search on Monday, and uh, if you look at each of the time periods, uh, you can see that um, the number of references in the PubMed literature have really spiked since 2009 in terms of the surgeons that since burnout. And as a chairman of a department of surgery, I have 74 faculty and 95 trainees. Um, and I think that the article that said that many of them experience emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, but most importantly, and this, I want to focus on this one aspect, a less of a sense of accomplishment. And in fact, in some cases, they are accomplishing less. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can avoid that. You know, I'm going to give you a list of the problems that we face today. But when I was coming along, Humana was buying University Hospital and making our lives miserable and taking the capital equipment out of the hospital and undercapitalizing everything, and we were pretty miserable with that. So I think we've just swapped one uh, set of miseries of the past for some of the miseries of the modern era. And I don't think they're more severe now than they were then. It is true. Uh, in many institutions that we've lost control to hospital administrators, and I would encourage you, if you're a young resident looking to take a job, think about taking a job where you are part of the management team within a health system, and we have to work hard in academic centers to see that we're affiliated as leaders and managers in hospital systems as opposed to sophisticated blue-collar workers. There is no question that burnout can become severe. Depression can become severe when you get sued. It is an emotionally draining process, having been through it having won and, and having lost at least one small suit. Um, if you've got a difficult, obnoxious partner, get out of that relationship. It's easier than a divorce. Move on. I, I like the smile. Um, but seriously, there are toxic relationships with partners that can really cause a, a surgeon not to fulfill <coughs> the joy and the glory of surgery. And I will tell you that I think today's typical two-couple families where both are professionals has imposed another really very serious uh, difficulty that does make work-life balance hard and stresses, stresses those families perhaps more than we would see 30 years ago. I hate the EMR. I don't think it's more efficient. And, you know, we all have the dashboard abuse where we're faced with how many RVUs have you put up and all the d different metrics, and this is the general stress. But once again, I don't think that these things are that much different than what we faced years ago, and I still believe that as Blake Kitty says, surgery is the prince of the sciences. It's the queen of the arts. So as I began to talk and experience faculty who had some of these feelings, I start to look at it uh, much in the same way that Viktor Frankl wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor and a psychiatrist and came back and talked about his epiphany that in the most extreme of suffering and anticipation of the absolute worst outcome, he discovered how important his relationships in life were. Um, a little bit of the next portion of this talk is going to be uh, a, a few things that I, as a 63-year-old chair of surgery, have uh, found as I have searched for a surgeon's meaning in life. It's very important as you move forward in life, you have certain things. Uh, you need a car, a house, um, food, <laughs> um, but don't overdo the things. Your happiness will not come from owning an expensive purse, uh, a fancy Porsche, um, or things nearly as much as it will come from 
your experiences in life, be it listening to music, looking at the Grand Tetons, catching a trout on a fly ride, talking with your wife over a glass of wine, um, or more importantly, you'll, your, your, your happiness will come through relationships with your patients, doing your patients well. And David Richardson, I guess, is a person who, who mentioned to me first the concept that when you get out of bed as a surgeon, you go to work every day to have a powerful impact on everybody's lives and to do the right thing. It's not like you're selling a widget. So these relationships can be a really, um, and I think, I think Richard understood that. He had great relationships, and he had a beaming smile, and he was optimistic, and he found meaning in life in his constant pursuit of doing things as he looked at a world and saw order and chaos and had an impact, an intervention by which he brought chaos into order. And you do that not only in your day job in terms of draining pus, for example, but you ought to be doing that in trying to be a better friend. You ought to be doing that in trying to be, my wife will say I haven't done as great a job as a better husband, uh, a better father. Um, and if you work on those things, I think you can, you can really make progress. I think it's interesting talking to the millennials and talking to the next generation, uh, how they want to save the world and how they have these ideological views of utopia um, and have very simplistic views of what you need to do to solve the problems of global health, uh, when most of them can't even clean their room. Uh, so I would encourage you to, if you want to bring order in life, get some experience doing it before you try to, uh, to prescribe utopia and before you become a victim and blame everybody else. Uh, so you know, this is a picture. The first thing we want to think about in terms of the opportunity to find meaning in life is to create order just in the things around you. This is uh, Admiral William McRaven. Uh, giving a, a lecture to graduating um, a college group. And if you haven't seen this uh, video, you really need to, really need to see it. Here, here are the, a group of SEALs, toughest guys around doing some of the most important work on Earth. And the way they begin to understand how to become important in life is by making the bed. It's, but if we go beyond uh, those things, how do surgeons do it? They're, those are the things that we do in yellow. And I want you to think just for a second pause. This is the reality we live in. We are incredibly powerful individuals as we transform the chaos of disease and sickness to health and wealth. As we take data, create it first, differentiate it into information, figure out how to apply it, it becomes knowledge, and then eventually some of that data becomes wisdom. We take suffering, we provide comfort, we take naive medical students who's Vision of things is almost like puppies with their eyes closed, and we actually educate them so that they become compassionate doctors. So I guess part of my message here is much in the way I looked at Richard Schwartz. I saw an individual that understood that he elegantly imposed his will on the world through his work and caused these transformations to occur. Your personal acts of work, be it in your personal life, your professional life, your activities to create value will be your genuine sources of personal fulfillment. And anybody who tells you otherwise is either, well, I won't go into that. They're wrong. Now, here's the problem that we get into in surgery, and a problem that I want to bring out where I think a lot of unhappiness comes from. The cartoon says, I agree you have drive, ambition, and self-confidence, but what we're looking for is competence. And so within the field of surgery, there is a ziggurat, if you will, of competence. Can you do it? And candidly, there are things in surgery that I don't need to be doing. I don't have the mentality to work with pediatricians. I, I can't do it or won't do it. I wouldn't be happy if I tried to do it. Um, I did have the technical ability to become a congenital heart surgeon, which in many ways is the pinnacle of that ziggurat, because I was technically superior. But I'm not Andrew Bernard. I don't have the patience of Solomon, and I can't tolerate intrusions into my daily schedule. I need a very structured, very scheduled life. So the idea that some pediatrician would present with me a child that I had to interrupt my day and do an emergency just meant that that was out the door for me. 
you really need to start to understand who you are as residents, particularly when you think about subspecializing. The problem I see with burnout so often, at least in my faculty, is when we have someone trying to do heart surgery who really ought to be a breast surgeon. That's a serious problem. And I see it time and time again. So think about your choices in life. And before you try to transform something, make sure you're a fit for that particular field. Make sure that you have the physical ability, the mental ability, the organizational skills, and if you're going to be doing sophisticated congenital heart surgery, you better be a natural technician. Um, you don't really need to be jumping through those hurdles. And that's one caution I have for you uh, today. These hierarchies of competence are desirable, and they need to be promoted. I currently believe that what is going to happen in American surgery is something very different. Right now, we train you based on time. That is going to end. In the future, you will be trained and you will acquire certain knowledge base. It will be verified by testing. You will acquire a technical base and then you'll be qualified to do a breast biopsy and then a port and then a trach. And then maybe a mastectomy or a partial mastectomy. You might get comprehensively qualified by your PGY3 year to be a comprehensive breast surgeon. And at that point, as far as I'm concerned, you could quit because you could be credentialed and privileged to go into practice and do that. And I think within 10 to 15 years, this is the way the model is going to work. Because right now, our credentialing and privileging process for kids finishing training and surgery is broken. What that means is, is that you can jump off the ziggurat doing the more simple stuff much earlier on in a truncated surgical training program and genuinely be capable to do what your credentialing papers say, which is not true today. I feel a little dirty each time I sign off on these credentialing papers where I say you're qualified to do the whole spectrum of general surgery because I know darn well you're not. And this pertains to everyone. And I will tell you, in Cincinnati, I'm not talking about a bad training program. I'm talking about training some highly qualified people that get the most competitive fellowships who can operate independently. So as we move from a ziggurat, if you, and I, I hope I don't offend your specialties because I was a breast surgeon, but that's at the bottom of general surgery. And then we move up to things like Oh, I have to say it, endocrine. Um, and, then <laughs> and then we move maybe to a more isolated organ like colorectal. And then we move to something a little more sophisticated. Uh, maybe it's trauma and critical care. And then we get into the highly technical specialties of surgical oncology, transplantation, heart surgery, vascular surgery, and then congenital heart surgery. Uh, I think these hierarchies of competence, it's tough to, it's tough to, to achieve the, those those abilities. And it may take you 12 years, but that's where we're going. And you'll see it in your lifetime if you're one of the residents today. So let's assume that you are gifted technically, intellectually, um, and you can do anything. The question though then becomes, will you do it? And this is a reflection of not only your abilities, but also your character. And as you move forward in life, you have to say, if it requires that sacrifice, am I willing to make it? As opposed to commit to a call schedule or a, a nighttime life, if you will, in liver transplantation, are you really committed uh, to do it? And as you step forward, if we think about it, we have to examine how well are we doing in terms of the virtues of life? Do we have the kind of integrity and discernment we need as a person? Uh, in our relationships, do we love the way we should respect and have humility? And when it comes time to act, are we diligent, thorough in assessing things before we act? Do we show temperance as we act? And do we have the courage once we have done those two to move forward with the right action at the right time? Um, I think that I don't mind telling you, none of you are perfect, but I also tell you I'm not either, of course. And I, I, I have many bad uh, aspects. I will tell you my reputation is limited by my weakest virtue, one of which is empathy. And it is true, I went to the Harvard Business School and was studying business and scored fifth percentile in empathy. Uh, you should laugh a little bit there because I also scored 99th percentile in productivity. Uh, but I, I promise you, 
that I am seen by my fellow chairs and other faculty as not having the empathy, and I have to constantly work on that. And you also need to remember Achilles was only as strong as his heel. So examine these things, though, and think about who you are and how that plays out in your daily living and how it affects your, your happiness. So as we go back to work and we talk about finding meaning, meaning in these transformations and the creation of value for patients, for your family, for your relationships with your family, and what I'm seeing today in every movement you want to talk about is people claiming victimhood with group identity, espousing blame, excuses, and denial as opposed to personal ownership, accountability, and responsibility. Your happiness is going to start when you stop blaming somebody else and start acting for yourself. I promise you that. Accountable behaviors, Richard Swartz, things happened because of him. That's what I want you to remember about him. Things happened when he walked into the room and he engaged your group and he was talking about agenda and you saw that enthusiasm, you saw him taking action. He assessed reality, embraced it, found solutions and made it happen. I never heard him once say an unkind word. I didn't went around him a, long, uh, for a lot, but I never heard him say an inappropriate bad thing about uh, anyone, and certainly he certainly didn't blame anybody for his fate. Um, if you want to be successful, start by making your bed and then very quickly become an accountable individual that assumes your rightful place. There is nothing wrong with being powerful. In its purest definition, power is work per unit time. It just means that you're able to leverage your influence and you're able to get more work done. Don't shy away from being powerful. How do you become powerful? Well, first, as a surgeon, go into a field that you're qualified to do where you're a personal personality fit, a technical ability fit, a mental fit, and then do things well. And then as you do things well and you become as good as you could be caring for one patient at a time, students, colleagues, peers will want to see how you do it and emulate you. You've become a role model. And so when we talk about teachers at the University of Cincinnati, we talk about role models. That's your goal, to become a, a deserving role model where people say, I want to be like Andrew. Once you get to that point, you've just acquired the base to become a leader. Now, anybody know what the opposite of a leader is? It's not a follower. The opposite of a leader is a helpless, blame-ridden victim. Okay? If you see the skies falling, I want somebody in my department who sees opportunity and says the time is right for me. And so that's how you're going to find happiness is when you see chaos and you see an opportunity to create order. Now here's, here's one thing I will point out. If you saw the, the overlapping Venn diagram, I'm going to go back to that. What, what was interesting that I didn't tell you is... The guy in the middle, that guy's got a chance to be happy. You move him out here, and he's just bored. He has nothing to do, really. You move him over here, and, and what's a good example of that? A kid in Appalachia with no real hope of even getting a foot in the middle to be empowered to transform chaos. We owe it to those people in the inner city and in, in, in the places where there's so much chaos and opioids and everything else in their life, to get them back in here in the middle so that they can really start to become powerful individuals that engage life and have an impact. Yeah, it's a philosophical talk a little bit. I'm an amateur philosopher, I guess, as I get older. Um, certainly not a psychiatrist, thank God. Um, one, one, one thing I'd just say to, to, to the, the young people in the crowd is uh, realize you're not perfect, and, uh, but begin to address those things and certainly don't sacrifice who you are um, or sacrifice who you could be for who you are and work to earn this validated self-respect. I want to say validated self-respect. Each of you should have at least four or five harsh critics. Andy's not one of mine. 
He says too many kind things about me. He's, he's not the best friend he could be, because if we actually got closer and a little more intimate, he'd really be more honest with me and tell me what I really should do differently. My wife's pretty damn good at that. Um, so my wife is an incredible friend of mine, and my son's an even better friend in many ways, because he actually tells me what, where I was out of line and out of bounds, and you better have somebody like that. And you don't earn self-respect until you have harsh critics. So most of you owe it to yourself, and most of you don't even have this already. Most of you don't have people that will come to you and sit you down and tell you that you could dress better, that you could speak differently, that you could be a better person, that you could be more fair, that you could have many more of those other virtues, and you need that. Because after you have that and you accept that criticism and you act on it, only then can you start to be anything other than delusional and earn self-respect. So I'll wind this up by saying one advice in terms of avoiding burnout, don't endeavor to become a specialist that you know where you're not going to do it well enough. And that means to do it really well so that you know, as, you know that you're as good and efficient and effective as anybody in that specialty. And if you're not, I promise you, you'll be, subject, you'll, you'll be subjected to burnout. I'm going to move on now and talk about surgeons and our missions. And clearly, uh, we care for patients. We continue through lifelong learning. We leverage what we know to others in teaching and we work to advance our state of the art. And, and we really help people, as I talked earlier about coronary atherosclerotic heart disease. While we can't cure that disease, we ensure palliative relief, chest pain, and increased survival time among uncured patients. And in some malignancies and in diseases like appendicitis, we can actually provide cures. We can transform people to live life expectancies equivalent to those who never had the disease, age match cohorts. Academic surgeons, I'm an academic surgeon, and I was woefully um, out of touch as a junior and even mid-level resident in terms of realizing that um, there's this continuum. As you take care of one patient at a time and you really get good at it, you become a role model. People are asking you how you did it. As you begin to explain that to them, you become a good role model and a good teacher. They appreciate that. People like great teachers like Frank Miller, who I appreciated, and Richard. And then you invariably start talking about better ways of doing things, how to, how to stage people with Sentinel Node, how to develop and revise that te technique, and then you wind up making discoveries. That continuum is surgery. Some of you will opt to only work in the clinical side of it and have very minimal roles in the teaching and discovery side. You're giving up something. Don't give that up unless you have to give that up. Because while we call them academic surgeons, I, I view it as part of surgery. I learned this, and I made this quote up when I was a resident, which is uh, watching Hiram Polk. And I tried to put together a sentence that would embody what he inspired in so many of his trainees. And that is that satisfaction, I never heard the boss say that anything was ever OK. It was either that's world class, that's first class, there are two other institutions in North America that could accomplish that, or, or that's the worst da, 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 case I've ever seen. Mark, Mark's smiling. But he, he realized that satisfaction with mediocrity is a cancer. It invades your mind, and it destroys your pursuit of excellence. You, you don't want to just be doing something in a mundane way. You want to know that you're doing it well, and that's why your specialty choice and your spectrum of practice should be something that you're expert at. But even though you may be as good as you get and you're content with that, you're still going to hurt some people. When you hurt people, boy, that can lead to burnout. And we all do it. Charles Bosk was a, a, a psychologist uh, who followed around um, a surgery group in Chicago back in the 70s and wrote the Sentinel publication, Forgive and Remember, on how surgeons were held accountable, and I alluded to it earlier. And when we criticize our internists to do manipulations of the pancreatic duct and cause trouble, um, they don't have the benefit we have. We have decades of understanding that we operate on somebody, they either bleed or don't bleed, get infected or don't get infected, live or die. We have visible outcomes. When we do elective surgery, we have an anticipation of success, and we have a short frame for that feedback to occur to know that we got it right. And because surgery was the first discipline to really cause visible harm, 
we created tools to manage that. I want to speak a little bit about that because in every operation there's risk and there's reward. And you as a surgeon are endowed, and that's where the glory comes from because you're hurting people. But you're trusted to hurt people in the name of doing something better for them. And, and I say, heavy is this accountable head that wears this wonderful crown of surgery. So what we did as a discipline, going back to the early days of the American Surgical, the Southern and others, we implemented structures to define for the profession our conscience. In other words, we had these national bodies to make sure that as new operations were rolled out, that they reliably achieved the results that we wanted them to achieve, and that as we populated communities with surgeons, that they were getting the results. We created very exclusive organizations. Uh, American was established in 1880. And these icons in the world of surgery who were trusted for their abilities, their knowledge, and most of all their integrity came together. They met, and then they sanctioned various operations, and then they sent the members back, and they were brought into the organization on a local basis. So that they go back to their communities, and these gods were told that you are to crush the deviations from our accepted standards in the name of safety and in the purification of the practice of surgery in the country of North America. And that's the way the American worked. That's the way the Southern worked. And it isn't an accident that Dr. Polk in 1971 was a tough, tough guy, as was Joe Fisher, as was candidly Ward Griffin in a little more elegant way, I might say, though. Um, but it was their job to make sure the deviations from standard of care did not occur. And so we developed a culture where M&M actually meant something and it was done properly. And we made failure, as we knew we would fail, something that was analyzed and it became an accountable feature of our daily life. As a result of that, we as a discipline, embraced this sort of collective consciousness, or conscious of making sure we did the right thing. And our, our processes, our procedures, our national organizations, unlike any other medical specialty, held us as individuals accountable. So when you talk about these proceduralists in medicine, that's why they cath somebody who's 92 years old and put a tavern in them. Because if, if they're incentivized by RVUs, that just happened a couple of weeks ago in Cincinnati, and I'm beside myself because they're not really thinking about the patient. Surgeons wouldn't do that. Heavy is the accountable head wearing the crown of surgery. And, and when we assess our bad outcomes for a patient, it begins with what could I, not somebody else, do differently. And so when somebody says anesthesia, I say, why don't you have a better relationship with anesthesia so we can control them and get them to do the right thing? So it comes back to you, even in terms of your relationships. So how do we handle failure? Now I'm going to digress and tell you a story from when I was 12 years old. Um, so my dad was a hunter and we raised uh, bird dogs and trained bird dogs for rich guys in Atlanta. And uh, my dad was a really good shot. And so one morning we turned the dogs loose, we started walking and we went down, found the hog pen covey, a couple of other coveys. My dad pulled the trigger seven times and killed eight birds. So the last time he shot, he waited until two crossed and killed two with one shot. And I didn't kill a bird. Um, and um, so we went to Etheridge's uh, store. And while we're in Etheridge's store, Dwight and uh, Clark and his dad uh, were there. And uh, they were talking about their great dogs, really. And uh, they were talking about uh, the fact that Dwight had shot a triple that morning. Well, my dad had shot two two, two, two uh two triples, and I guess a double, but with only seven shots. And uh, so I'm listening to all this, and um, I'm looking at my dad, and I'm drinking a Yahoo. Uh, it goes down real fast. It doesn't last very long, these Yahoos. Um, chocolate drink, and um, pot belly stove. And my dad looks at me, and he says, well, son, you ready to go? I was too afraid to prod him to tell them what he had done that morning, but I was so angry that he wouldn't tell them. We walked outside and he said, let me tell you something when I asked him why he didn't tell them. He said, there's two kinds of hunters in the world. He said, there's those like them that talk about the ones they shot. He said, and there's them guys like me that just talk about the ones they missed and I didn't have much to say. 
And I think so when you think about that story and how it affected me for a lifetime, what I've seen over the lifetime in David Richardson, Hiram Polk, Andrew Bernard, David Sloan, Pat McGrath, all these guys and gals that have worked with me, Mary, Mary Fallot, um, what I see is great people who have attained incredible happiness in life who are very good at what they do, are a perfect fit for what they're trying to do for their patients, who hold themselves to an incredibly high standard. And really, because they're so good, it's easy for them to focus and be honest and talk about the ones they missed as they get better and better and better and enjoy life more and more and more every day. That's the formula I want to tell you about for surgery. Your happiness and fulfillment will come from achieving your outcome every time and, in many cases, in the face of uncooperative individuals and obstacles. Of all disciplines, surgery has nurtured, demanded the most trustworthy commitment to the sacred bond we know and revere as this doctor-patient relationship. There is not another specialty that has done this as well as general surgery and the ultimate general surgery subspecialties. This, more than any other factor, is your segregating career choice and the genesis of your sense of duty. In fact, your clinical superiority, and there's not any there's no reason to, to deny it, at least in my view. You, you, the people who are clinically superior are the general internists who are dedicated to the patients training in great places like Emory where I think they were even better than the surgeons and really those that comprehensively care for the patients in the best way. It will give you glory and it will affirm your identity as a surgeon. So don't put yourself in the position of being weak or weaker uh, by how you choose to practice. I think that um, when we think about surgery and we think about ego, um, I say this to the applicants when they come in, um, your ego is a collection of beliefs about oneself that embodies the answer to who am I? And I got to tell you, if society is endowing you with the opportunity to hurt somebody and to make an incision and you have earned it, and you've earned it because of your superior intellect, and you've earned it because of your superior ability and your integrity, I, I'm not going to go into denial and tell you you're not superior because you are. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't adhere to all the other virtues of humility and everything else and carry yourself and interact with ED docs and all the other specialties the way that you should, because you should, and you should be a gentleman and a lady. But if you can do what we're asking of surgeons to do today, which is massively difficult, then, then you ought to take some pride in who you are. And it's not about your ego. The problem with that little picture is your ego, that's too small. Your ego can never be too large if your other virtues are intact. And so you have to keep all those other virtues attended to. It's okay to have a big ego. You think that Dean McKenzie, who does congenital heart surgery in Houston, Texas, walks into that operating room with a tiny ego? You crazy? He knows how good he is. He knows he's one of the five best congenital heart surgeons in the world. Jim Tweddle at Children's Hospital, he knows he's one of the, he may be the best congenital heart surgeon in the world, but he's also a gentleman. There's nothing wrong with knowing it. There's a, there's a lot wrong with abusing it. Your ego can't be too large if your virtues are intact. Richard Swartz had a big ego. He knew how good he was. I bet Janet would tell you that. <laughs> so you'll find true happiness when you secure the approval of yourself, knowing that your principles are superior and that you adhere to those, uh, those virtues. So let's think about the nouns that define us. If you notice on my coat, it doesn't say chairman, it doesn't say professor, it says surgeon. There is no more noble noun. When you walk into my office, it says surgeon on the wall. Everything else that describes me is an objective. I am not a surgical oncologist. Please don't call me that. I'm not a clinical educator, a clinical scientist, a clinical attending. I am an oncologic surgeon. I am a teaching surgeon. I am an academic surgeon. I am an attending surgeon. Don't insult me and call me something else. I've earned it. It is glorious to be a surgeon. I'm also a professor and chair, but that's not nearly uh, anything I revere 
the way I revere being a surgeon. I will tell you, I began as a son, as many of you began as a daughter. Very fortunate to have a loving mother and wonderful dad who supported me. I became a student and a friend, and I was oftentimes not the friend I should have been. I was an okay student. I did make 1020 on the SAT, so I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack, that's for certain. I bet Mark Evers did better than that. Um, and then I became a husband, and probably that's the relationship I probably failed as much in terms of revering the, the role I should have. I uh, went on to become, this is me as an intern, uh, got my degree at Emory, became a physician, became Dr. Polk's intern, uh, their re resident, eventually an MD Anderson fellow. And then I, I paid attention to those things. I've been blessed to live an incredible life. Dr. Schwartz lived an incredible life. And I think that we're very grateful that we've lived life big. And if you want to live life big, honor your nouns, honor the relationships you have, honor the virtues, and try to put yourself into a position where you can form at a high level. During the days we now live, I know of no more noble calling than to be a surgeon who has honored his nouns, paid attention to the virtues, chose you the field where you're, you're the real deal and you're a real leader performing at a high level, and then you've earned self-respect. Thank you for your attention. A little philosophical. Fantastic. I don't know about that. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to get the questions uh, started here. When I visited Cincinnati, um, you mentioned something to me that, that uh, you reminded me of here. It relates to your attention to virtues. Yeah. And the priorities that you choose to set for yourself. And uh, it was that you called your dad every day. While he was father? sick, yes. My father every day while he's sick. Right. I remind him to take his medicine. Yeah. And that was my mom also, right. Yeah. Mom. yeah. Well, I, I have a saying that uh, when I'm dealing with surgeons who want to kill somebody or they have had unprofessional behavior, um, I, I tell them, uh, and I usually give them some of this, but I say, when you get home from work, pour 30 cc's of Woodford Reserve, sip it, pet your dog, don't have cats, <laughs> and kiss your wife. And if you are still feeling angry and frustrated, repeat. And if you still feel angry and frustrated, call me and, and come over. And, and a corollary to that, which is tragic, is that I had a congenital heart surgeon, a fantastic man, very temperamental, hot-tempered guy. And he did want to kill somebody. Um, and he did come over. My lovely wife, Carol, served dinner to him and his partners as we tried to harmonize the relationships. We made some progress, but then on Christmas Day that year, I got a phone call when I was skiing with my family in Beaver Creek um, telling me that the bur bottle of bur bourbon I'd given him, he'd actually washed down a bottle of Vicodin and killed himself. Um, so, you know, the stress that we incur is real. Um, we do have to encounter people who don't see the world the way we do, who put up obstacles, who are not as committed as we are, and we still have to figure out ways to work with them and around them. And poor Jonathan was, uh, I worked with him hard, but I really felt I had to wonder if I could have done more. But I do think it's important, you know, I call my mom every day now. Uh, my dad has passed away. Um, we were privileged to allow him to die at home without being admitted to the, to the, to the hospital, which was kind of cool. Um, and... Uh, but yeah, I, I think you should definitely do that and maintain your role as a son and a daughter, even if you're in your 60s. Uh, I think it's really important. Can you contrast for us the harsh critic versus a mentor? Tell us how to find that harsh critic, those harsh critics. We need a, a couple. Yeah. Few. Well, uh, as Mark can tell you, uh, I didn't have to invite Dr. Polk to be a harsh critic. And. Um, and uh, even when I became chair in Cincinnati, I invited him to Cincinnati, and I said, don't hold back. I said, tell me the things I'm doing well and the things I can do better. I thought I was doing more well uh, when he got done with me. Um, but he's, a, he's like, I actually loved him, but I think more of my father, uh, because he, he really invested energy in me. And, and, uh, but he, he was my hardest, meanest critic, and most of the times he was right. Sometimes he was absolutely wrong, as Mark knows. Um, but you got to invite him. you got to bring these people in. I brought David Richardson. David Richardson can be, be a tough guy. 
And he's a little kinder than Hiram, but he's one of my, my critics. Frank Miller was never really a critic to me. He, he glossed things over, but he was a great friend. Carol's a pretty tough critic. My son John is probably the worst critic I got. Um, he can be cruel with his criticism, but, um, uh, but you got to have them. And you really can't validate yourself in any way until you really ask those people to, to provide you feedback. And, and, and you hopefully you can earn the right to be a harsh critic in somebody else's life. But it's important, and it's just candor. My wife reminds me, Carol's here, I, I just saw her back there. <laughs> Thank you for coming. That uh, also, I, I have a marriage with her, not a residency. So um, that uh, there is a different set of relationships. I thought I'd get a real laugh out of that, Carol. So. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think you need critics, and you need uh, friends, and different people play different roles. Um, I, I will say, I don't know if I have it. This is something that, that I have on my desk. It's how, how you get a contentment, a life fulfilled, little regret, goals revered, sometimes met. To those who watch us try and fail, stayed resolved, we show and tell. It's not for them. It's not applause. It's self-respect, the worthy cause. I think that's how you find meaning in life, genuine self-respect. Pity those who do not know a personal limit, their bar so low. Blisters, aches, blood and sweat, bills we pay to seal our debt. Self-respect earned by few. Find your limit, pay your due. Nor win nor loss the outcome meant, honored goals, our life's work spent. Self-respect earned is billed. Now tis ours a life fulfilled. And I think that what that is trying to say is that we should all have goals that are based on that one foot in chaos and order. Our goals are to make those transformations occur. Our goals are to make life better for somebody else, for ourselves. Um, our goals should not be simply to blame, excuse. Our goals should be how can I become powerful, accountable, responsible, accountable, and powerful and really cause great good things to happen so that my life and other lives are, are enriched. It's the goals. You don't always succeed. You sometimes meet them. Um, but the people I admire, those men and women in the trenches, I don't know that Evers are able to cure cancer. He's working toward it. Um, but he certainly has a good set of goals. He reveres them. He works at it diligently. He has stayed resolved. And I'm quite sure when he lays down at night, he's got some serious self-respect and a massive ego. <laughs> All right. I have one more. Okay. Uh, I want the crowd to have an opportunity to ask a question, too. You love studying sphingolipids. I do. And uh, you skipped the sphingolipid meeting in Israel last week because the resident interview day fell. Yeah, when you on the Wednesday, yeah. So you're deeply committed to those interviews. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't actually don't rank the residents. Um, so what I do is I try to just be the irritant like Ross Perot. Remember he said, I'm the grain of sand that makes the oyster make the pearl? Well, that's what I am in the interview process. I'm there to put four people into the room and say to one of them, uh, what's the weakest part of your application? And she says, I didn't do any research. I said, no, that's not it. You made 215 or 225 on step one. That's your problem. And then if she can't take that, and she, if her ego is so damn fragile that she can't take some little criticism like that, how the hell do you think she's going to do down in front of me in the amphitheater talking about a patient she damn near killed? But if she could say, yeah, that's a pretty bad score, um, but she still realizes she's a wonderful, good person, there's a reason I tell you I made 10, 20 on the SAT. I want you to know I'm not very bright. Um, but... But you've got to have an ego. And if you've got an ego, then I can make a surgeon out of you. But if you don't have an ego and you're offended by that and you're just some weakly, weak person who wants to sit and talk and blame the chairman of surgery for being inappropriate, well, then great. Train in Indianapolis with Gary Dunnington. You just answered the question. <laughs> Well, I will say this. I look for interns who are as tough as $2 bills, have 
skin as hard as steel and breath as hard as kerosene. That's from Towns Van Zandt, by the way. But uh, yeah, you want a tough kid. Um, as Hiram said, he said to me, I called him and I was crowing about uh, the, the, the match and the scores we had this seven, eight years ago. And I was telling him how great this entering, entering class was. He said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, why, oh, right, Dr. Paul, why, why is this a bad thing? And he said, well, you just basically just brought in a completely entitled group of interns. So they all know, think they're God's God gift to Cincinnati, and you're going to have trouble with them. He said, I'll tell you something, son. He said, the kids that are going to be your best surgeons and your best leaders are kids that are, just don't know how dumb they are. He said, you know, if they've scored less on the exam, but they're determined, if their mama was a teacher, um, and they've been raised right, he said, you know who they are. Those are the kids you want to bring in there. And they'll turn out to be something in surgery, and they might even turn out to be a leader someday. You want somebody who's, you know, not too smart, reasonably dumb, somebody like you. <laughs> somebody like you. I thought, is that a, is that a compliment? <laughs> but I do, think, I do think there's something about grit. And so you need a baseline IQ. You don't need a super IQ. You need a baseline IQ. You need lots of grit. The best surgery resident I ever trained is a kid named Cutler Quillen. And he was right here from, uh, his dad owns the bridle shop that makes all the bridles for the horses, Quillen Leather. I'm sure you've seen it. And he worked in that leather shop for the family business. And he was a smart kid and he came in and I, when I met him, the same thing happened with me with him as happened with Dean McKenzie when I realized he was a congenital heart surgeon the first day I met him. I looked at Cutler, and I came up, and I told Carol, I said, I've met the young man who will embody everything I ever wanted to train in a surgeon. He's not perfect, but he's going to become a superstar. And on October 28, 2015, Jean Ahmad from Columbia called me and said, I just want you to know Quillen's here and doing well, and I've never had a young man join my faculty who knew more and who was as technically gifted and superior as this young fellow. And he said, and by the way, this old Kentucky boy has got impeccable integrity, as you know. I said, yeah, he's like a son to me. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for kids that um, have a background. They've shown some proclivity to leadership. They don't lie and exaggerate and tell me that they, you know, or have all these crazy interests and hobbies and do all this community service and it's all a bunch of lies. I don't care about that stuff. Uh, if you worked in your family business, if you're a first-generation immigrant, uh, if you've suffered, uh, if you've had some kind of minor leadership deal, you got a baseline IQ, and you got hunger, you know, then you can get there. All right. Dr. Edwards, it is glorious to be a surgeon. <laughs> it is. <laughs> on relationships. Relationships were really important to Richard. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue the event and the celebration of Richard's life, um, further developing our relationships over a glass of wine. Carson and Janet Schwartz Evans have invited us to, to their home. Everyone here is invited. It's just over on Ashland, and we'll meet everybody there. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much.